Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us on The Doctor Is In. I'm Dr. Allison Awardy. I am the commissioner at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Today is Wednesday, April 29, and we have a special guest with us today. Um, this is Alderman Roderick Sawyer. Uh, welcome, first and foremost. Thank you for having me, Doc. Um, and uh, just because not everyone may, may know you, I'll say a little bit about you, and mm -hmm. then I'll let you kind of right. fill in a little bit. I, I know you're the alderman for the sixth ward. Yeah. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll let you say kind of who you represent okay. here in Chicago. All right, well, thank you for having me today. Uh, again, I'm Alderman Roderick Sawyer of the Sixth Ward, which includes the areas of uh, Park Manor, Chatham, Auburn Gresham, Inglewood. Uh, those are the bases of the communities that uh, make up the Sixth Ward. And Alderman Sawyer is the chair of the City Council on Health and Human Relations. And That's so correct. Chicago Department of Public Health, we work, you know, we work together sort of throughout the year. And then That's obviously correct. with COVID coming, there's a lot more attention on, oh, on, on this than there has absolutely. been previously. Um, and uh, you're, you have your JD, you're a lawyer. I'm a lawyer, uh -huh. uh, class of 1990 from Chicago Kent College of Law. All right, yeah. great. Um, and previously you were chairman of the City Council Black Caucus. That's that is right. correct. Okay, great. Um, so, first of all, if you have questions, I'll go ahead and do the quick data update like we do every day, but start thinking now about what questions you might have for the alderman. Um, as someone who is getting a lot of questions, I am sure, from Absolutely, constituents, yeah. and you want to think about how this is, this is fitting into that kind of work. So start putting those in. I'll do just a quick data update, and then we'll come back and sure. talk a little bit. Um, so, as always, go to chicago.gov slash coronavirus, and right up at the top, you can find the latest data tab and that's where every single day we update it with um, the latest numbers the case counts the demographics we update the maps uh, you can look and see what hospital capacity is looking like here in the city of Chicago you can link to some of the more live data where you can see what testing rates have changed over time so as of today we're at 19,624 lab confirmed cases of COVID-19 and 826 deaths among Chicago residents residents. Uh, that was an increase since yesterday of 945 cases and 53 deaths. So we're obviously still getting a lot of new cases and unfortunately a lot of deaths right. really coming in yes. every day. Uh, that 945 cases, that is a lot of cases, but where we compare it to the approximately 20,000, it actually is us still continuing mm -hmm. on our curve flattening. So um, I think tomorrow we're going to show some, some more specifics around uh, data related to that. Uh, our 19,624 cases in Chicago are part of now more than 48,000 uh, lab confirmed cases in Illinois, and our 826 deaths are among 2,125 across Illinois. We've now seen COVID-19 in uh, 96 of Illinois' 102 counties, and we're up to about a million cases in the U.S., more than 55,000 deaths, and about 3 million around the world, wow. more than 200,000 deaths. Some good news on testing. Um, as we've been saying really every day, we've mm -hmm. been seeing some improvements here, although we still have a way to go, and we may talk about that some mm -hmm. more. Um, but our seven-day average, where we look back over the last seven days, we're now up to an average of 2,629 people per day being tested here in Chicago. So that's good progress. Um, and if you look on the um, on the on the on the data download there, you'll see that we've really seen a nice increase, just especially over the last week, week and a half. Um, our percent positivity, meaning what percent of those tests are positive, still remains, right, you know, as of today, it's at the 29% mark. So okay. um, about 70% of the people who get tested have a negative test, and about 30% of the people who get tested have a positive test. I think for the sake of time, we won't get into more of the demographics, um, but let's just pull up our one um, basic chart. This, again, is our epi curve that just charts every day the number of cases that we're seeing um, against the day that the test is actually done. So as always, on the right side of that curve, you can see those, those bars are just a little bit lower because we're sometimes, we still, it can take a day or two, even three days, for test results to come back in. 
So I think maybe the only last thing I'll say is that um, there's new data out from the CDC, which is really interesting today. And I encourage you to go to the CDC website, uh, or there's a number of journalists that are covering it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure it'll be in the paper here in Chicago. That there's been some good analysis looking at what we call excess deaths. So. We always know in epidemiology about how many people die. Like in a given mm -hmm. year, you know, in a given month, we sort of have an expected number of deaths. Right. Um, and so what the epidemiologists at the Chicago Department of Public Health, but now also at the CDC, have been looking <laughs> at at a national level is, you know, over the last five years, what has been the average death mm -hmm. rate? Like how many would you expect to die? And there was some studies that were done that looked just at the sort of one month period between early March, March 8, which is before we were really kicking off here. Just, you know, that, that week is when we just started to see some of the early community transmission. Things were really getting going with coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So between March 8 and April 11, they looked just at that month or so and found that there are more people dying even more people dying than are being officially reported in the coronavirus test numbers. Oh. Um, and so in New York City, for example, 325% um, more people had died in that time period than had died in, on, average. on average. Yeah, so like three times what you would expect wow. the death rate um, to be, or even more so. And then they sort of count down from there. Um, Illinois was listed at about 113% um, of, of what we would normally. So we're, we're really seeing during that time period normally um, where you might expect, um, you know, we've seen 1,400 more people die across the state of Illinois during that month mm -hmm. than you would expect based on, mm -hmm. based on prior years. And over that same time period in Illinois, there were about 682 deaths reported from COVID. Mm -hmm. So we've had about 1,400 more people die, cool. and about 682 <laughs> of those be counted as COVID. So there's about 700 additional deaths, and there needs to be some more work and analysis. Some mm -hmm. of those people almost certainly died from COVID. And right. so this gets at understanding, um, need, you know, this is before the death certificates have come through. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, but getting at this sense that uh, this has really impacted death rates mm -hmm. even beyond the way that the, the official reporting is going, which which we know, because again, t we, we know that there are more people with COVID than are being tested. We know there are likely more people who have died than have necessarily been tested. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a lot worse in places like New York City, where they had so many more deaths and less ability to test. But here in Illinois, we're seeing it too. But it also can mean that there are more deaths not from COVID. And so this mm -hmm. gets into some of the potential unintended consequences that you can see if you've got people who are delaying medical care or are not seeking care mm -hmm. for things they might otherwise seek it for um, because of COVID concerns. Mm -hmm. So this will be a much larger piece of work, but it's just an interesting mm -hmm. um, epidemiology study out today, which helps us really measure, you know, at, at, at the level of deaths, which is one of, you know, the worst outcomes of all of this, uh, what some of the true impact of COVID mm -hmm. likely is across the, um, across, the, across the city and across the country. So with that, um, let's, 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 let's turn to you a little bit. So first of all, um, talk to us a little bit about what kind of questions you're, you're getting from constituents. Like how, how has your life as an alderman changed as a, relate, as, as a result of COVID? Well, it's, it's very interesting because it it's changed in a sense in how we do work. Yeah. It doesn't change the fact that we're still, we're still working. Absolutely. We're working, every, we're working seven days a week. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, I think people will feel more comfortable with contacting you at all hours <laughs> because they know you're at home. So also true for the health department. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is actually probably more work now, uh, more hands-on work. Uh, obviously, more phone calls. I've learned how to use Zoom now, yeah. so I'm 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 fairly uh, adept at it now. Yeah. But it was something I didn't know a thing about right. a few weeks ago. Right. So, uh, but I'm, I'm doing work in a different way. Our staff is still communicating regularly. Uh, we're still filling, uh, requ service requests. We're still fulfilling them, making sure we're contacting our various departments who are also still working. So I have to give a shout out to Chicago city workers that are out there, mm -hmm. you know, really doing the hard work, uh, during this time, uh, whether it's streets and sanitation, water, CDOT. Yep. Uh, these organizations are still working hard for us in the city of Chicago, and they're still responding to our requests. 
it's a new normal, but it's, it's different, but they're still out there doing what they can. Absolutely. These yeah. essential workforces these are, that we these are truly depend essential on workers. every day. That is absolutely sure. correct. For but it is, it is a different, uh, uh, we were laughing about it off camera. <laughs> This is the first time I've had a full set of clothes on in, in a while. <laughs> uh, from, from the waist up, I've, I've put on ties and jackets, but usually I have on pajama bottoms and, or sweatpants Just or like something. the rest of the world, if you shoes don't have are, to go out. Shoes are new to me right now. <laughs> so it, it is a little different than that. Uh, cleaning bill is down, but, yep, yep. Uh, but it, it is different. But I, I think that we're, you know, understanding the severity of this. We want to make sure that we're all practicing, uh, doing what's necessary. Uh, shelter in place. Uh, we're saving lives by staying inside. Absolutely. I've done a couple of PSAs that I've put on my website uh -huh. uh, for those that Tell look. folks about them, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, if you go to the number six, WARD, sixward.com, uh, I've posted a series of, of public service announcements. One is actually kind of funny, uh, you know, it's my saving lives, what am I doing at home kind of uh, thing. But we talk about a variety of things from youth. Uh, uh, we know we had a, even though I, I recorded these a few weeks ago, uh, we just started putting them up and it was apropos since we've had these youth parties lately that have been subject of the news uh, yep. recently. So we want to make sure that people understand how serious this is. And even if you feel that you're invincible, this is something that you need to be mindful of because you're going to go around your parents, your grandparents, uh, children, those that, are, uh, uh, that have ex uh, conditions that may make this virus even more severe for them. And it's, it's extremely serious. We need to take this seriously and do what's necessary. Stay home. I know it's frustrating. We know that you want to get out. You know, the weather's starting to break. Um, I went outside in my backyard yesterday. I, I, I get it. But I, I went outside in my backyard. Right. <laughs> just That's alone. The... Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. So we've already got a question. Leon Nicole Pettis from Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the outreach plan for 17 to 25 year olds to help retain them at home as the weather becomes warmer? Do you have, you know, well, some, some of that again, is related yes. to this? And... Yeah, I, I did, like, for example, I did put a PSA out specifically for youth yep. uh, to address, you know, their invincibility and yeah. what they think it is. And, you know, just how important it is. I know there's a lot of false narratives out there, myths saying that uh, COVID's not going to hit young people. Right. Black people don't get COVID. Exactly. I mean, all of those are false. Those yep. are not true. Right. Um, you know, let's look to the science and look to what's real. Uh, we see the first African-American, the first person to die uh, in the city of Chicago was an African-American woman uh, in Auburn Gresham, which yep. is one of our targeted areas. Yep. Uh, we want to make sure that you get the message out that you need to stay inside as much as you can. Make sure that you're not spreading this or you're not a carrier of this disease, of this, uh, um, and just gotta make sure that you stay safe, your family stays safe. Uh, let's get past this so that we can get back outside and start making connections again. Yeah, and I'll just follow on with that by, you know, sort of driving that mm -hmm. point home that just in Chicago, right, in our 19,600 plus cases, mm -hmm. um, almost 3,000 of those cases have been in people 18 to 29. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we've had 2,918 lab diagnosed cases. Um, that's 15% of our total cases in Chicago so there you in go. that 18 to 29 yeah. age group. Um, and if we, look at the, if we look at the death data, we've had six people die yeah. in Chicago who are between 18 and 29. Um, and uh, again, we know that the biggest risk is to the older people, but even young people can get sick and in unusual circumstances they can get severely ill and, mm -hmm. and some die. But then the point is also, you know, if, if, if younger people are getting infected, even if they're having less severe illness, if they are then spreading it to some of these people in yes. the 60 plus, 70 plus, or people with underlying conditions, you know, unwittingly they can sort of serve as, as, a, as someone transferring the virus. And I know that we uh, talked about it again earlier, this uh, youth that have pre-existing conditions, That's a lot right. of youth with asthma and That's other right. conditions exactly. that, that could make this uh, virus even more uh, fatal for them. Yep. So it's definitely necessary for you to stay in shelter in place, 
let's get this move past us. Yeah, absolutely. And we talked, you know, at baseline, even yes. before, mm -hmm. you know, before COVID, um, uh, Chairman Sawyer and I, you know, talked quite a yeah, lot about right. the, the Healthy Chicago 2025 yes. plan, which really highlights that at baseline, half of the life expectancy gap, the black white life expectancy gap in Chicago, where white Chicagoans on average live almost nine years longer than yes. African American Chicagoans, completely unacceptable, absolutely. completely preventable. Mm -hmm. Half of that gap is due to these underlying conditions. Yes. So the diabetes, the lung disease, mm -hmm. the cardiovascular disease, and so much of what we're seeing really acutely in neighborhoods like, you know, like That's the correct. ones you represent, you know, 90... 2.3% of our deaths today, you know, are in people who have these underlying conditions. That is so. correct. And that's something to be aware of. And again, you know, the data is what it is. Let's look at it and make sure you understand it and follow suit. Yeah. What do you do to help get some of the right messaging out to, to your constituents? Again, you know, like you said, it's, you know, we try to, you know, sometimes I, I appreciate what the mayor's done, for example, making, you know, making it kind of interesting yeah, and almost the memes fun, and the memes yeah. and everything, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, it's, and I, it's, as I talk to people, people really like those and they've made up their own, uh, yeah. I even talked to some of my uh, business owners that have, uh, that are sheltered, that are closed down, some that are taking a lot more lighter attitude, they'll put a, a picture of Mayor Life in front of their business, you right. know, <laughs> with the arms closed, right. and, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, but, it, but people are getting the message and, and I think people are really uh, following, uh, following suit, and they're doing what's necessary. Yeah. It's that small percentage of those that are just think that it's necessary, uh, necessary to have a party to do what's. Uh, I had a call yesterday um, in uh, Park Manor area on, on 76 in Indiana. I'll say the address if I would, but it's on 76 in Indiana. Someone is having a party. Stop it! Stop it right now! Let's you know get this uh, shelter in place in effect. Let's stop spreading this virus. We have a lot of concerned citizens in, our, in that area, for example, that are calling me left and right, calling the police, calling, and to continue to do that, call 911. If you see large gatherings in your area, call the police. Make a record of it. We don't, if you don't make a record of it, the police are hard pressed to respond to it. So let's keep that going. Call 911, get those requests for service up there so that the police can respond accordingly. Yeah, and we do know that the great majority majority of Chicagoans are doing a good job with Absolutely. this. Absolutely, every single neighborhood in Chicago has seen significant increases since the stay-at-home order mm -hmm. has come in place. Right. Remember, we do that some of that anonymous monitoring where we don't collect anybody's individual cell phone or mm -hmm. device data, but at a population level. Mm -hmm. um, if you remember, we talked about this. We we actually, um, if you're if you've allowed your cell phone to share your location in mm -hmm. an anonymous kind of way, it actually pings your device through the day, mm -hmm. um, and it compares it to whether you're at home, and home is just defined as wherever your device uh, typically spends, spends the most, most time, time between midnight and 9 a.m., and, you know, back before COVID, we look at February when it's cold, and a lot of people are probably <laughs> home anyway, mm -hmm. you know, most of the city, we were staying ho at home anywhere, we were at home, I should say, uh, a median, kind of like an average of about 50, high 50, low 60 mm -hmm. percent of the time um, and that would be all the time you're sleeping at home eating at home you know home with your family mm -hmm. and then the rest of that time is when we're out and about and what we saw is that even as the weather has been warming up with these these various orders first you know some of the early ones then the stay at home was the big one mm -hmm. but even the lakefront um, we really saw increased Monitor increased um, amounts of cell phones and devices staying within home, and that's actually you know right through last week we were uh, we were up over eighty one percent across oh, the whole great. city, mm -hmm. um, and that's eighty one percent of the time. All of our cell phones, the ones that are being followed here, are at or within 200 um, meters of home. And you think about that, you know, essential workers, like mm -hmm. my cell phone doesn't stay near home. Like anybody who's out, you know, doing all the, the, the work that the yes, city right. workers and the healthcare workers and everybody else, like those folks can't stay home. We also know people need to go out to get food, to get mm -hmm. other essentials. Um, so the fact that we're really seeing that in every single neighborhood, um, and uh, and we, we've seen, you know, neighborhoods are, Everybody's either between kind of the 70 and 80 percent or the 80 to 90 percent. Um, That's extremely encouraging. Home. Yeah. It really is. And we need people to hang in there. Like mm -hmm. it's it's hard. And as the you know, the, the, the days go by and it gets warmer. Um, we talked about, you know, yesterday the weather was mm -hmm. nicer yesterday. Yeah. You know, stepping outside into the yard, onto the porch, going for short walks by yourself. 
open your windows, mm -hmm. but like, please, if you can limit opportunities, um, it's just such a critical oh, time. Yeah. I did my Zoom call outside yesterday. There you go, yeah. perfect, yeah. perfect. Um, all right, so mm -hmm. what, what kind of questions and concerns are you hearing um, from, from folks in your ward? Well, equity is one issue. Yep. Uh, my, as you know, my ward is about 98% black. Yep. So that equity is always an issue, both in the distribution of resources yeah. and, let's be honest, opportunity. I mean, uh, for business owners, for example, the, I know we have an RFP coming out for the cloth mask. And yeah. I want to congratulate uh, Mayor Lightford for um, committing to making a distribution to uh, I think it's 5,000 masks per ward. Yeah. Cloth, the reusable cloth right. masks. Yeah. And uh, yeah, let's talk about that yeah. for a second because sure. I don't think we've talked about that on no, here actually. Yet, no, yeah. Okay. So the city actually has put out a request for proposals to to for, to to purchase a million. Mm -hmm of That's these correct. cloth masks and we actually we did the research at the health department to the, we looked at all the studies that have been published about mm -hmm. you know what kind of cloth works best and what you know what what the what the specifics of this need to be um, in terms of using some higher count cloth mm -hmm. um, higher count cotton or there's a few options on there in terms of like what materials right. can be used um, but yeah like if there are you know we, 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 mm -hmm. we want businesses in Chicago to be thinking about you know being the ones yes. um, to, to to, and to and again, that's of one of the con obviously one of the concerns: access to food. Yes. Uh, I have uh, uh, my ward is is, is heavily seniors uh, senior populated. Yes. So uh, those that even those that have never been to a food pantry before, right, find themselves maybe looking for uh, food options. Right. Uh, coming up. Uh, yeah. So that those are kind of the idea, uh, things that are coming up heavily in my ward. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we're having a pretty healthy stay in place. Uh, compliance yeah. uh, with our individual uh, constituents in the ward, yeah. but they do want to know that things are happening. Uh, testing centers, for example, yeah. they want to yeah. make sure that they they have access to testing centers. So if they do feel ill, they don't have to go too far to get tested. Yeah, and I actually, you know, thanks for bringing that up. I think you know we we had looked briefly at some testing maps, but maybe we'll yes. pull these these okay. these up again, and I'll I'll show them sure. to you here, and we'll and we'll show folks at home. Um, let's let's pull up first our number of individuals that are being tested um, mm -hmm. for COVID nineteen, and uh, go ahead and describe to folks which zip codes and and, and where yes. that is on the map for well, for the areas uh, for you example, represent. For example, the area I represent is predominantly six zero six one nine. 60620, 60621, and a small portion of 60637. So those, are, and they're all in, with the exception of 21, all in the high or highest category as it relates to 60620. Yep. Exactly, and that's related to how many individuals are actually getting tested. Um, we're working to really push testing to make sure that where we're seeing cases, and you know, your ward has been disproportionately impacted yes, by cases correct. and by deaths, and so part of that plan, um, and you know, some of the race equity rapid response that you know we've had folks on talking mm -hmm. about, um, Auburn Gresham in particular is yes. one of the focuses there. Really wanting to make sure that uh, resources mm -hmm. are getting there of all kinds, right. and, and testing sort of is a piece of that. And then if we pull up the other map, this is where we look at by rates. Um, and by rates is when we correct for population. Mm -hmm. So there you see that although a lot of testing is done, we still have some way to go yes. um, because you have a lot of people who live in, in your area. Right. And so this is sort of the balance between driving testing to where it's needed, but still I want, I want you to know and I want mm -hmm. your constituents, really everyone mm -hmm. in Chicago to know, we are still pushing very hard for more testing. And we really want to make sure um, that that testing is getting out to the neighborhoods mm -hmm. where it is most needed and that's one of like our highest strategies so um, for example um, I did pull because I think mm -hmm. sometimes there's still some mystery about how, how testing works. Like right. sometimes people think the health department does the testing. The health department does. Yeah, the health does, department doesn't do the testing. Do testing. No, we don't. But we we um, help really sort of coordinate testing resources uh, where there are investigations mm -hmm. in long-term care facilities right. or some of these other congregate settings. We'll sort of make sure that testing happens. But like Chicago Department of Public Health, like we do not have a laboratory, so mm -hmm. it's right. it's all kind of in conjunction. But we've been working with um, some of the uh, 
uh, primary care clinics sort of in and around mm -hmm. um, you know your, your neighborhood sure. and I, you know I just pulled some up to kind of give give mm -hmm. folks a sense here so if people know TCA health at 8425 Cottage Grove or yep. beloved community family Wellness Center mm -hmm. at 6821 That's South Halstead mm -hmm. is that your word mm -hmm. um, or or um, UIC Miles Square Health Center, 641 West 63rd, yeah. Chicago Family Health Center, 120 West 111th, Christian Community Health Center, 9718 South Halstead, another TCA Health at 1029 East 130th, Chicago Family Health Center at 3223 West 63rd, uh, Iman Community Health Center, 2744 West 63rd, Friend Family Health Center, 5843 Southwestern. All of those facilities, which are really good community-based mm -hmm. primary care centers. Every one of them has testing. Now, one question I do yes. get, cost, yes. if there is one. Yeah, absolutely. So um, all of these that we listed here are, are within the um, federally qualified health centers mm -hmm. or the, or the lookalikes. And so mm -hmm. what that means is that if you are insured, the cost mm -hmm. gets billed to your insurance. insurance right. If you are not insured, including for people who um, may be undocumented, like from an immigrant mm -hmm. standpoint, um, there there's a sliding scale that, right. that is in place. Um, and these are, these are centers that get extra federal funding uh, to help make sure that people who may be lower income, for example, right. mm -hmm. um, are able to get the care that they need. And that sliding scale does go all the way down to zero. So okay. people who are really at a low income level, um, and of course with COVID changes, everybody yes. recognizes a lot of this is really in flux, um, that that uh, the, the, the cost um, for getting care there you know, in, in any way is zero. Any testing that the, the, that the health department is sort of supporting or pushing out is, is, is free of cost. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of work done to really make sure that, especially in settings like this, yes. uh, mm -hmm. cost is not a burden. There's been a lot of conversations at the federal level about wanting to make sure the test of, 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 of COVID, the cost of COVID testing is um, being covered. We're still working out some of, some of those details. Um, but really, these, these are settings that they're, they're designed to not mm -hmm. put further financial hardship on right. people. And they've all gotten additional um, millions of extra dollars from the federal government to help support COVID work That's as well. Great. So mm -hmm. we really at the health department want to um, support, you know, we work pretty frequently with, with these yeah. organizations anyway. They serve such an important primary health role. And so we have a lot of interest in thinking about how to build up their capacity for COVID testing. And ideally we want, if there are people who are not connected to care at all, mm -hmm. right? Maybe, that's absolutely right? Correct. Like maybe you've got some of these underlying conditions. You haven't been to the doctor in 10 years and maybe you have hypertension. Like thinking about how to connect into care, even if COVID testing is sort right. of a- And that's an something we've been talking that. about for months now. Yeah, as far as the coordinated care. Exactly. Uh, physical and mental health. That's uh, right. Yes, that's correct. That's right. And so we've been really pushing, you know, we, we're doing about 2,500 tests um, every, you know, every day, give or take here in Chicago. But, you know, we want to be doing a, at least twice that and probably yes. more than that. And yeah, sure. um, we've got plans to do more of that in these congregate settings. We've got plans to do more of it in these mm -hmm. community-based settings. Right. Um, and we want to make it accessible to people. We know that drive-through testing doesn't work for people who don't have cars. We That's know correct. that right. um, people who, um, you know, may have concerns about leaving their, some of these more vulnerable populations. That's Are there correct. ways down yes. the line? Mm -hmm. We think about getting testing to them. So so it's going to be a conversation for a long time to come, but um, yeah, thanks for thanks for for bringing that one up. All right, let's let's get some more questions going here. Um, okay. Tarek Fayumi from Facebook. Uh, you touched on this a little bit, but mm -hmm. how do we handle scenarios when we notice people are not following the social distancing rules? When I talk to my police officers, and I, and I still, I attended my, my CAPS uh, meeting, uh, virtual CAPS meeting, they want you to call uh, 911. They want you to call and put a request for service in. Uh, this is an emergency time, and if you see people not following the social distance guidelines, you see large gatherings of people for no particular reason, call the police. Call um, so someone can come out and investigate the situation and hopefully make dispersals and uh, get people to follow the safe distancing requirements that we've put in place. They are there for a reason. This is not an arbitrary thing. This is not because we don't want people to get together. We want to, people to stay alive. 
you know, it's, it's odd when you talk to doctors, and I have the utmost respect for doctors, but when they talk about acceptable levels of death, you know, these are hard conversations to have. The epidemiology of this, when you talk about acceptable levels of death, that's not an easy conversation to have. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it's not, you know, right. no amount of death is acceptable. Right. Every one opinion. of these statistics is, you it's know, a, it's, it's a, a person it's and a, person. a family. And, Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, they have a really tough job to do. Let's make their job easy. <laughs> Let's stay home. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Aura Jackson is asking, are the locations for testing on the city website? I'm talking about the ones you read. Okay, great question. Mm -hmm. So this is something um, that we're working on actually on a few levels. So um, as you may know, we've the, we, the mayor and I, we've been doing mm -hmm. some of these sort of emergency public health orders yes. um, where we kind of change the rules, change the, the mm -hmm. laws a little bit. So things like the staying home from the lakefront. Um, that closing that that was a that was a public health order that mm -hmm. is in place not forever but in a temporary way uh, during the public health emergency and we're actually doing some more work around um, some more oversight and some mm -hmm. more uh, both making sure that people who are doing testing are sharing that up and that we're yes. able to capture it in a way that is easy for people to understand what and how to get it, um, but that also making sure that as they are doing the testing, that is getting reported back into um, the Chicago Department of Public Health. And so we've got, like actually probably today, there's going to be another order that mm -hmm. won't look very, it's, it, it's not exciting to right. people in the way that, you know, the lakefront or the liquor stores or right. some of those are, but it's some pretty specific language about requiring um, some technical language in mm -hmm. like the way websites are done that will actually make some of this more searchable and up-to-date yes. and so that we can do a better job of sharing all of this with you in an up-to-date manner. And Aura, uh, I, I have to know Aura very well. Now, she's a very uh, active member in the community. Oh, great. Uh, we do try to we mirror what you put out. Yeah. When you put things out at chicago.gov forward slash coronavirus, we make sure that it's on our sixward.com site. And we want to make sure that we continue to try to update. As they update, we try to update as well. So keep uh, keep up with us. And matter of fact, I'm going to call you, or I need your help with some mass distribution. So <laughs> expect a call from you before the week is out. Perfect. You want to talk <laughs> about mass distribution a little bit? Well, yeah. Uh, with addition, obviously, you know, the, the Wilson Foundation uh, gave all the Alderman masks yep. the other day, which we're very appreciative of. So mm -hmm. we're trying to get those out. Uh, the mayor's master, which are coming, uh, we want to make sure that they get out. Uh, it, they, do, they do me no good sitting in a box at my office. So <laughs> we want to make sure that we uh, enlist those that want to help uh, with mass distribution. We're trying to find ways to connect with our block club organizations and our Great. community organizations. And we'll probably do one, at least one mass kind of giveaway uh, so once we find the logistics of it and find a location to do that. But what we want to do is get these masks out to people. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough that early this morning I was able to go by St. Calabanus which has a food pantry every Wednesday, and I was able to get distributed masks to Father, uh, Father Matt down there today. He was very appreciative. But we want to get more out, and uh, as we just got them yesterday, we want to get them out to people that really need them. So we're uh, just call us, let us know what we can do, and then what we can do together to get these masks out to, to the most people. Perfect. And Patrick Brutus, you just asked, he, was asked, he was wondering, what are some of your distribution plans for the masks you received, Alderman? So there yes. you go. Pat and Patrick and, has my number. Oh, you know him too. It's all good. All the, right. all, the, all the people Patrick are, are using me. the right. opportunity. Right. Um, <laughs> After the show. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. Um, <laughs> and I really, you know, the, we, the, we really like the, the, the cloth masks in mm -hmm. particular because those are reusable. And where we think about this being something that we're going to be in mm -hmm. at least through vaccine. Um, I think in the, in the short term, having some of these disposable masks is important, but really getting more at the root of the mm -hmm. issue and wanting to make sure that, again, this is mostly around protecting others, right? That when you right. are out, mm -hmm. you know, it helps keep your germs from coming out. And so you are doing something good for the community, the community and for right. those around you and people who, you know, could be at risk if, you know, you especially, maybe you had COVID and you didn't know, you know it, you it, were right. Symptomatic or not symptomatic yet, um, so we're really um, look you know looking forward to having more of those cloth masks available. And then we know the aldermen are very you know really know have a lot of knowledge of where they're most needed um, yes. within their wards. So, all right, let's let's hit let's hit maybe a couple maybe aimed a little more at me, but feel free to, feel free <laughs> to chime in as, as you like. Um, okay, so Sikander Sheikh from Facebook. By wearing a mask, 
We are inhaling our own CO2 or carbon dioxide. How does that help? Research shows we have dormant viruses in our body or pathogens. We wear a mask, we don't inhale fresh air. Are we activating those pathogens and then could test positive? Explain. Okay, so um, when you're wearing- Definitely your question, right. What? <laughs> so definitely your definitely question. Definitely my question, yeah. <laughs> so when you're wearing a mask, um, it, it does, in a limited way, uh, affect the amount of carbon dioxide. But where we would worry about the amount of carbon dioxide would be if you had a very tight seal around your face, even more than like the healthcare hair, care worker um, masks would be. Your body is very, very good at getting rid of carbon dioxide. Um, so I think to this this question about like, might I have a dormant virus? Might I have dormant COVID in my body? And if I if I understand, it's that maybe if I'm not not inhaling fresh air, does that somehow help those pathogens activate? And and no, you do not have to worry about that. So if you, you know, dormant COVID or sort of any dormant virus mm -hmm. in your body, um, it doesn't have anything to do with whether fresh air is coming in or okay. not to to how that virus will, um, will behave in your body. The whole way that the virus kind of behaves in your body has to do with your immune system. And so that's why, um, you know, many younger people who mm -hmm. have stronger immune systems, at least for this virus, seem to really be able to fight it off with not as much symptoms. That doesn't have anything to do with, with fresh air or oxygen levels. It's their own innate immune system. Right. And so... Uh, no concern that wearing a mask um, would somehow worsen your own, um, uh, you know, anything about COVID or any other uh, pathogen that, that could be in your body. So good question, not a concern. Um, and let's take one more kind of more medical one here. Joel Maxine Jr. from Facebook. Since copper can kill the virus on surfaces, we talked about that at, at some level, not 100%, but um, since copper can kill the viruses on surfaces, shouldn't copper supplement pills be used as treatment instead of vitamin C? Okay, no. So um, we talked the other day that there is some interesting research that copper has some antimicrobial, meaning it can... Uh, it, there's some thought about using copper more in the bed rails in hospitals or in gotcha. the, um, you know, places that many people would touched. touch. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't kill it 100%. It's just that the virus doesn't last as long on, on surfaces that can be copper. But that does not at all translate to putting copper into your body. So um, no evidence that copper supplement pills would do anything um, to mm -hmm. impact on COVID-19. And actually you asked in comparison to vitamin C, even vitamin C, no evidence that vitamin right. C also really impacts this. We talked the other day that if there are people who take regular vitamins, particularly if you've been prescribed those, you should continue to take them. Um, but that otherwise uh, we don't have any evidence yet for anything. Um, there's 100 plus trials going on for all kinds of different substances. Um, and I will absolutely let you know as soon as we've got right. some evidence that anything um, helps, especially in a preventive way. But I would not encourage you to be trying to take things, especially if we don't know how they're regulated and, and where they're coming from. All right. Um, let's see. Um, Sonia Seegers is wondering about, uh, this is kind of for both of us, are there food shelters on the south side? Um, so meaning probably like food depository. So I'll start with just Greater Chicago Food Depository, Meals on Wheels. Um, there's a whole homelessness and food and shelter directory on chicago.gov slash coronavirus that lists by zip code um, some resources uh, near you. So that is a good place to start. Do you want to chime uh, in? Yes, I stated earlier, if you go to my site, sixward.com, uh, we list the uh, area food uh, dispersal sites in our area, uh, both in our ward and surrounding our ward. So if you go to our site, the number six, six WARD.com, uh, or if you register with our site, you'll get weekly updates with us, which includes the uh, food pantry list as well. Perfect. Um, and as always, if you're just not sure where to go or you don't have uh, internet, 311. If you dial 311, um, there are city workers there who are all set up to help you make sure that your needs are getting met. And that absolutely, it always includes food needs, but especially right now, yes. mm -hmm. it, it's, it's one of the biggest priorities and one of the things that as a city, we've put the most resources and thought into making sure that everybody um, has those basic human That's needs correct. met. Yes. 
All right, so we are coming up actually on the end of our time. Oh, so um, fast. So fast, I know. <laughs> Tomorrow we will do some more data and we'll get through more of kind of the sciencey questions. Mm -hmm. um, anything, we, we like to sort of end with some either kind of good news stories or things that people could do today. Uh, anything you wanna, you know, something you've heard that has been sort of a good news story coming out of your ward or, or something that can kind of I think the best thing that I've heard consistently are numbers of people that are stepping up and doing good deeds yeah. uh, all throughout our ward. We have people that are stepping up to uh, do meal delivery services. Uh, we have Mother Wade uh, at Josephine's Cooking, which uh, she's going out delivering meals to seniors. People that are coming up, offering their cars and personal vehicles to go help make deliveries. Uh, mm -hmm. Rage, for example, in Inglewood, they're doing a lot also with food deliveries. Uh, Shepherd's Hope another organization in our ward that are doing great job in food delivery. Uh, what they're, they're doing, and, and they're having people that aren't getting paid, no money whatsoever, they're taking their personal vehicles, they're using their personal PPE, uh, personal protective equipment, and they're going out and doing God's work. Mm -hmm. They're going out and, and doing what we consider just great things to help with seniors, help the disabled, those who just can't get out, they're sheltered. Uh, but they're having struggles with uh, access to food, for example. I like to commend these organizations, My Block, My Hood, My City, also Jamal Cole, who's mm -hmm. also a six ward resident. Uh, these are just a few of the many, many people that are doing great jobs out there, uh, providing for those that are unable to provide for themselves. And I, I like to thank you all. I can't thank you enough for what you do and what you all continue to do for the six ward and for the city of Chicago. Yeah, it's been one of the things. It's it, It's been great, actually, how mm -hmm easy it, uh, it is yes. for us to find ways people have just been stepping up and being That's so correct. selfless yeah. people send us in all kinds of good stories yeah. and you know it's this like really terrible time for the city but the way people have just been creative and putting others first and thinking about how to help others uh, in correct. every corner of the city has been really remarkable mm -hmm. and um, you know I hope that it really continues as we sort of move mm -hmm. you know move ahead into yeah that's that spirit of, uh, of just get, plugging and getting together I think is you know something that's showing itself and that's a positive that's going on right now. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll give just two pieces of good news um, that are mm -hmm. that are a little on the city side. So for one, um, Chicago Department of Public Health has actually passed uh, 7.5 million pieces of personal protective equipment that we've distributed to the healthcare setting. So I'll remind you that there's a whole separate network that sort mm -hmm. of happens in the community and right. for all of all of this good work. But we also um, we keep this stock pile that is really designed to make sure that every hospital in Chicago, every long-term care facility, nursing home, mm -hmm. um, all of our first responders importantly, and then we fill that in with other kind of other needs where there are public health needs um, uh, has been in place. And that is not something that, that the Chicago Department of Public Health normally does. We keep this stockpile mm -hmm. for emergency. We've been building it up over a, a decade or more. Um, and then obviously when COVID hit and we saw all of this disruption in the supply chains and a lot of our hospitals and others not having that PPE. Um, we've got people working around the clock uh, pushing that out and really continuing to do that. And so um, we were now over seven and a half million pieces wow, of PPE. Great. So yeah. that's that's really good. And thanks to my team, there is a huge huge workforce behind the scenes um, on both the stockpile side and the donation side and the just working to think about what does it mean to protect um, each other and right. especially protect our, 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 our essential workforce at this time. And then the other good news, um, people may have seen that yesterday um, Commissioner Rosa Escareño from the Business Affairs and Consumer Protection Department at the city announced yeah. that the city is giving out another five million dollars of um, ver of grants to what, what they're calling micro businesses. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're five thousand dollar grants that are going to one thousand micro businesses, and the, mm -hmm. and it's part of a new micro business recovery grant program. So the grants are available to Chicago businesses with four or fewer employees. Oh, so these are really the very small but really important crucial. Absolutely. Um, 
um, you know, especially in some of in in, in um, you know they're they're meant to especially help people in lower to moderate income neighborhoods that have been hit hard by the coronavirus, and the money can be used for for working capital. Yes. So the yeah, the grants great. are going to be distributed on a lottery basis. Those interested in applying can go online until May four, and it's at chicago.gov slash recovery grant. Sorry, Chicago.gov slash recovery grant. And the program's especially meant to help these small businesses mm -hmm. that might not be able to get help through federal programs, right. like the Paycheck Protection Program might be struggling to take on debt. So the city had already had a $100 million loan program mm -hmm. for small businesses, meaning up to 50 um, employees, but this was an additional grant program and for $5 million. And that's an area that's really especially needed, those micro yes. businesses, those small, everyday mom exactly. and shops. That, right, that we know that they're we, really... Yeah. Yes just needing it. So please, if, if you yourself um, run one of those businesses or you know somebody who does and they're really struggling and right. thinking about how is my business going to keep afloat, this is a way to um, get a grant as part of the new $5 million investment right. from the city. So um, those those are you know some good news on, on behalf of the city. Keep sending us in um, examples of where you see Chicagoans stepping up or where you see good mm -hmm. news. We certainly right. need good news and um, you know continue to please just hang in there it's such an important time uh, as we're seeing the curve flattening. We're still not on the downhill yet. Right. Um, and uh, we're making lots of plans for what it will look like when we start to move beyond shelter in place, but we're not there yet. So um, thank you again to Alderman Sawyer. Thank the, you, Doctor. The, the, Appreciate the, it. Yeah, the, um, the, the chair of the Health and Human Services Committee for the Alderman and really a longtime partner and, uh, you know, help for the Chicago Department of Public Health. Thanks for everything you're doing. Thanks for having me. Um, and I, I appreciate the time. As always, we will be back tomorrow at 11 a.m., more focused just on your questions and science and data tomorrow. And in the meantime, stay home and save lives. That's right. Thank you. Thank you.